All right, we are reading In Her Hands, the story of sculptor Augusta Savage by Alan Schroeder and illustrated by Jame Burrill. American sculptor Augusta Savage was born in 1892 and passed away in 1962 was born and raised in Green Cove Springs, Florida. She was by nature a private person and little is known about her life. In fact, she has been called one of the most enigmatic figures in American art. In this book, I have tried to present the facts of her early life accurately. I hope I have captured some of Augusta's spirit as well. As both an artist and a teacher, Augusta Savage was a central figure of the Harlem Renaissance, and though only a small fraction of her work survives, she deserves to be better known. Out back, behind the house, there was an open pit filled with clay, soft and gooey, just waiting to be shaped into something clay. Every afternoon, Augusta, Augusta would sit barefoot at the edge of the pit and make little clay figures. Her mama, Cornelia, didn't mind, even if she did think it was messy. But her daddy, Edward, disapproved. He thought Augusta was wasting her time. One afternoon, he came out to the pit and gave her a sour look. What you doing there, girl? Augusta held up her hands sticky with clay. Playing, making stuff. Playing, Edward shook his head. He was a preacher and didn't believe in play. You ought to be reading the Bible instead, he told her. Cultivating your mind, saving your soul. I don't want to read the Bible, Augusta said stubbornly. Edward grabbed her by her wrist and yanked her to her feet. Don't you never talk back to me, he said, and he gave her a sharp swat on the rear so she wouldn't forget. Twice a week, the entire family had to go to church. Augusta and her sisters would put on their best dresses and the boys their best pants, and Cornelia would take them down the road to church. The only part of the service that Augusta liked was the singing. After her father's sermon, the men and women of the choir would step forward and begin to sing. If Augusta was lucky, they would sing her favorite song. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. After church, Augusta would hurry home and put on some grubby clothes. Then, plopping down next to the pit, she would sink her fingers into the wet, gooey clay. Nothing made her happier than to take a fistful of wet clay and turn it into a duck or a chicken or a little pig with a curly tail. The whole time she lived in Green Cove Springs, Augusta made little clay figures. She gave some to her brothers and sisters, but mostly she kept them hidden at the bottom of her mama's trunk, where her daddy wouldn't find them. Edward didn't like to see to see them around the house. He called them profane, and if he found one, he would crush it to dust. One afternoon, Cornelia went to draw water from the pump. Next to the shed, she found her daughter crying, clutching a smashed clay figure in her hands. He didn't have to step on it, Augusta kept saying. He does it just to be mean. Cornelia ran her hand through Augusta's hair. No, he's not mean, she said. He's just, he doesn't understand, that's all. He'll come around, Gussie, give him time. When Augusta was 15, Edward took a job at the church in the southern part of Florida. Augusta packed up her dresses and her shoes and her little clay figures, and with the rest of her family, she moved to West Palm Beach, but she didn't like it there. There were no clay pits in town, none that Augusta could find anyway, and for nearly a year, she didn't make a single clay figure, not one. Her heart grew heavy, and she wondered if she would ever work with clay again. Then one day, Augusta was riding in a wagon with her school principal, Mr. Mickens, when she saw a sign in the front of a shop, Chase Pottery, factory open to the public. Pottery, Augusta thought, that means clay. Stop, stop the wagon, she cried. I've got to get out. 
Mr. Mickens drew the horse to a halt. I'll be back in a minute, Augusta told him. And then quickly she ran into the factory. There was no one inside, but out back under a battered tin roof, she found a long work table, a potter's wheel, and buckets and buckets of clay. Augusta wondered where it came from. <clears throat> I have a friend up north. He sends it to me, the owner told her. Augusta dipped her fingers into the bucket. The clay was soft and gooey, just like the kind she had known in Green Cove Springs. Only this clay wasn't red. Go on, take some, the potter said. I've got plenty, but you've got to promise to show me some of your art sometime. Maybe I can learn something from you. Augusta was surprised to hear him use that word art. She had never thought of her pieces that way before. It was certainly something to think about. You seem mighty happy, Mr. Mickens said when Augusta returned to the wagon. Augusta nodded. I've waited a long time for this day. At home, Augusta showed her mother the three buckets of clay that Mr. Chase had given her. Cornelia looked worried. If I was you, I'd keep it out of sight, she warned. It'll just make your father mad. Augusta hid the clay, all 25 pounds of it, in the tool shed under a feed bag. It wasn't long before Edward found it. He was all set to throw it out, but Cornelia begged him not to. Edward, I've never thought of you as a mean person before, and I don't want to start thinking of you that way now. Augusta ain't done nothing wrong. Just let her be. But, but it's sinful, Edward insisted. Reaching over, Cornelia took the buckets away from her husband. You go inside and wash up now, she said. Supper's at five. Augusta never found out what her mother had said to her father, but from then on, she was allowed to make as many clay ducks and chickens as she liked. One day, for fun, she sculpted something very different, a Virgin Mary, 18 inches high, with soft, folded hands and a face like an angel. She took it to school, and when Mr. Micken saw it, he was impressed. You've got real talent, he said, and it shouldn't go to waste. We ga he gave Augusta a kind look. Tell me, how many brothers and sisters do you have at home? Thirteen, Augusta answered, plus me and Mama and Daddy. That's a lot of mouths to feed, the principal said. He knew that Augusta's family was poor, and he wanted to help if he could. I've been thinking, he went on, if Mr. Chase is willing to give us some clay, I'd like to, I'd like you to teach the other students how to work it and how to make little figures like you do. If you do that, Augusta, I'll give you a dollar a day. Augusta's eyes widened. Every day, she whispered. She couldn't believe he had that much money. The principal smiled. That's right. Every day. Edward didn't like the idea of Augusta teaching other children to waste their time, but he was sure quick to take the dollar that she brought home every day. Long after Augusta had stopped going to school, she continued to make figures out of clay. Dogs, cats, houses, people. She liked her work, but as time passed, Augusta grew up. She wondered if her sculptures were any good. It wasn't enough that her mother had said so. She had to find out for herself. When Augusta was 27, she entered some of her clay figures into a county fair. On the day of the contest, the judges moved from table to table, writing in their notebooks. Cornelia was sure that her daughter would win. I've seen every enter entry, she told Augusta, and Gussie, yours is the best. Then Cornelia's voice dropped. Don't tell your father I said so, but I really think you should become an artist. The judges agreed, and Augusta won $25 first prize. She also won a special ribbon for the most original exhibit. That evening, in the moonlight, Augusta walked home with George Graham Curry. Curie, the man who ran the fair. They had met only a few days before, but already they had become good friends. I think your mama's right, Mr. Curie said. Maybe you should become an artist. For several days, Art Augusta had been thinking the same thing. I could help you if you'd like, Mr. Curie went on. I know a sculptor in New York. His name is Salon Borglum. Is he famous? Augusta asked, pretty much. Even got his own school, Mr. Curie nodded. I'll bet if you were to ring his doorbell, he'd be glad to give you a hand. When Augusta arrived home, she discovered her mother sitting on the porch. <clears throat> it was a warm night and Cornelia was fanning herself. Augusta sat down beside her. Mama, I've made up my mind. I'm going to use my money I won to go to New York, she said. I'm going to become an artist. Cornelia looked startled. New York, but that's so far away. Aren't you scared? 
Of course I'm scared, but I, if I don't do it now, I never will. Augusta took hold of her mother's hand. Oh, Mama, be happy for me. That's what I need. Cornelia wiped a tear from her eye. I am happy for you, she said, but girl, I'm going to miss you so. <clears throat> On a hot day in late September, Augusta took the train to New York City. As soon as she arrived, she found herself in a little room in Harlem. Then she went to see Mr. Curie's sculptor friend to ask if he would give her lessons. Salon Borglum was a nice man, but he shook his head. I'm afraid I charge $10 a lesson, he said. Do you have $10? The unhappy look on Augusta's face was all the answer he needed. Don't give up, he said. There's an art school here in New York that doesn't charge any tuition. I'll write you a letter of introduction, try to get you in. Mr. Gor Borglum reached for a pen. Meanwhile, Augusta looked around the room. On every shelf, there were sculptures of cowboys and Indians and bucking broncos. Are these all yours, she asked. The artist nodded. Yes, indeed, every one of them. I grew up in Nebraska, he said. Roping and riding, I've even lived on an Indian reservation. I guess you could say I sculpt what I know. He signed his name to the letter and he gave Augusta a curious look. Tell me, Miss Savage, what do you know? Augusta was confused. I don't know what you mean. Oh, I think you do. He smiled. What matters to you most when you think about your life? What comes to mind? <coughs> Augusta had never been asked that kind of question before. She closed her eyes and thought for a moment. Green Cove Springs. That was what she cared about. The place where she'd grown up with its clay pits and its smelly sulfur springs and the school she'd gone to and all the kids she used to play with, Maisie and Margaret and Pee Wee. She thought of her daddy's church and all the people who went there on Sunday to listen to him preach. She could barely see her daddy in her mind up there at the pulpit, clutching the Bible and talking about Jesus and doing right and a glorious day sure to come. She remembered holding on her mother's hand while next to the pulpit in purple robes, the members of the choir rocked back and forth, filling the church with joy. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Gusta opened her eyes and Mr. Borglum was looking for her. How could she explain to him what she'd seen in her mind? You don't need to tell me, the sculptor said. I could see it in your face. He folded the letter into thirds and slipped it in an envelope. I hope this gets you in, he said, but if it doesn't, don't come back. There's nothing more I can do for you. The next morning, Augusta went to Cooper Union School and presented the letter to the lady in charge. Miss Reynolds was a tall, thin woman with her hair done up in a bun. She read the letter and handed it back to Augusta. All right, she said. Where are your pieces? Show me. Augusta was taken back. I don't have any, she said. What? I mean, I do, but they're at home in Florida. Miss Reynolds frowned. So you brought nothing to show? Nothing at all? Augusta looked at her feet. I'm sorry, she mumbled. I didn't know. Miss Reynolds glanced at her watch. She had work to do. At the same time, she felt sorry for Augusta and I wanted to give and wanted to give her a helping hand. Listen to me, Miss Savage. I want you to sculpt a piece for me tonight. I don't care what it is or how small it is, but you bring it to me tomorrow morning and I'll decide whether or not to admit you. That evening in her tiny apartment, Augusta unpacked a heavy lump of clay she had brought, bought at an art supply store. Using a knife, she cut the clay into several pieces. What she had in mind was a barnyard scene. She had been sculpting ducks and chickens for years, and they were easy to make. But would that be enough? A family of ducks? What would Miss Reynolds say when she saw them? With a sigh, Augusta mashed down the duckling she had started. Then she remembered what Mr. Borglum had said. Sculpt what you know, Augusta closed her eyes and thought deeply church her father the pulpit those long sermons those were things that she knew best that very morning on her way to cooper union augusta had passed by a church through an open door she'd seen it, a minister standing at the pulpit speaking to the congregation a big man with a wide friendly face augusta tried to picture her fe his features his close-cut gray hair the birthmark on his cheek the gap between his front teeth 
It took a while for Augusta to fix the image in her mind. Then she took a deep breath, sank her fingers into the clay, and went to work. Hours passed in the apartments above. Someone was playing piano, a ragtime piece. Down below, a baby was crying. Out on the fire escape, Mrs. King was cooking hot dogs, but Augusta did not hear the piano or the baby, and though her windows were open, she did not smell the hot dogs. All of the attention was given to the block of clay in front of her. That was the only thing that mattered. Here and there, pockets of stars appeared in the sky. The piano had gone silent. The baby was quiet. Harlem was fast asleep, but in one third floor apartment, a light continued to burn far into the night. Early the next morning, Augusta showed up at Cooper Union. She looked very tired as though she hadn't slept. In her hands, she held something heavy, covered with a dish towel. Well, let me see it, said Miss Reynolds. I haven't got all day. Augusta placed her artwork on a nearby table. She then removed the dish towel and Miss Reynolds studied the sculpture with a critical eye. Hmm. At one point, she turned the bust around so she could see the back of it. Minutes ticked by. Miss Reynolds jotted something in the notebook, then she turned to Augusta. Tell me, where are your parents, she asked. Are they in New York? No, ma'am, they're in Florida. That's where they live. My daddy's a minister, Miss Reynolds nodded. Well, you're, you write to them tonight and tell them that their daughter is officially a student at the Cooper Union School of Art. Augusta could hardly believe her ears. You mean it, she cried. You'll start tomorrow morning, Miss Reynolds replied. Come by my office at nine o'clock and you didn't bring any clay. We'll provide all the supplies for you. Outside, as she stood on the steps, Augusta's heart pounded with joy. Ever since she was a little girl, she had be dreamed of becoming an artist and now that dream was about to come true. At the bottom of the steps, something caught her eye, a hopscotch pattern on the sidewalk. Augusta laughed and setting down the bust she was carrying, she began to skip lively. Mabel, Mabel, set the table. Don't forget the red hot label. Shake the salt and shake the pepper. Who will be the highest stepper? A group of students who were going into Cooper Union stared. A few even laughed, but Augusta didn't care. She felt too happy. Besides, she had to do something to celebrate. With her eyes shut, she skipped back to where she'd started. She collected the bust that she had made, the one that had gotten her into Cooper Union. Then half walking, half skipping, Augusta turned her steps toward Harlem, toward home. She had a letter to write. The end.